Don't worry about our friend Barry Allen. He heals as fast as he runs. Speed. It's the power that the Flash is best known for. And when we think about that speed, we usually associate it with running. However, um, like healing, the Flash can do everything fast. He can read fast. He can consume enti an entire library of books in a mere afternoon. He can eat fast. He gives a new definition of the term fast food. And he can just scarf it all down. His hypermetabolism means that he eats and does not gain weight. Again, that's the superpower I want. Forget the running. Forget the lightning bolts. Forget all the... I would eat and not gain weight. He can also drink and never get drunk. That's an interesting power that we don't need to talk about. He can um, defy gravity with his speed and actually run up the side of a building. He can build up a static charge by running around in a circle and launch it as a lightning bolt. His, power, his um, ability and his speed gives him a few other powers that we're going to talk about in the, in the upcoming weeks. But I just want you to get the point. It's not just about running. It isn't just about moving in a straight line direction. Now, for this power to work, he needs a word. He, he's got to have this word, and it was brought in that clip. The word is he needs to have some restraint. The act of stopping or holding back, the state of being stopped or held back. A force or influence that stops or holds us back. Control over thoughts or feelings. And what you see about the word restraint, it's like a governor on a car. I remember when they put the, first put governors on cars. They don't really put them on there anymore. But when they came out, it was actually the Plymouth... Was it, it wasn't the mods, it was the little, the little boxy cars that came out, and they came out with a governor on it that even though the speedometer said that it could, it could go 90 miles an hour, you, you couldn't get that thing to go over 55 miles an hour if it was going downhill in a windstorm because it had a governor on the engine and it, it would cut the power when it started. It was restraint. It was built to keep you from speeding. But, but we understand the idea of restraint and in the clip we saw, they're eager to see your full potential, but I caution restraint. And you know, when our faith, when we accept Christ, we come in and we're all eager and we're all ready to go and we're ready to move and we're ready to do this and we hear things and we, get, we catch on to a vision or we catch on to this and we're ready to do things. But sometimes in this faith thing, restraint. You know the term, right? Be still. Know that I'm God. You're going to have to have a little bit of restraint. Now, when I use that word, there are a lot of different ways that we could go with this particular sermon. We could do a sermon and we could talk about restraint and how we need to have some self-control, the ability to manage our own feelings and, and emotions. We could go jump into James and we could talk about the tongue and our inability to control it. But I think both of those are connected to a bigger issue, a bigger lesson. Our, our inability to control our emotions, our inability to control our tongue, I think has to do with a lesson that, well, it's what we do. We have to learn how to slow down and focus on the moment. This is what it says in Psalms chapter 90, verses 7 through 12. We, notice it doesn't say you, it doesn't say me. This is a we mentality. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your in indignation. You have set our iniquities before you and our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass, and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is great, and the fear that is your due. Here it is. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain heart. We may gain the heart of wisdom. This idea is all about this word focus. Now, in case you haven't noticed, um, if you go back and you start listening at the beginning of the year and you listen to this sermon, you're going to hear it all the way through. 
I've kind of become obsessed this year with the book of Psalms. Um, when it came to the book of Psalms, it's a song book. I know what it is. It's a book of poetry. It's got pretty lyrics. They make really good praise and worship songs, but to be very honest, I never really considered them as lead material for sermons. Good, good sectional material, maybe a good way to start a sermon. You know, but but as, I, as we began lockdown last year, I, I began reading through the book of Psalms, more to feed my own soul than anything else. And as I began to read through this, um, I learned some very valuable things about who God is, including that verse, be still and know that I am God. It, it comes from Psalms. And remember, most of these Psalms were written by David, and David had this life where he, he had a problem. David struggled with his past and struggled with his future, and, and the moment that he was in always seemed to be beyond him. And when we reach Psalm chapter 90, we see that it begins with talking about God's anger. God is angry. And, and you know, when it comes to church, I grew up in church, and I told you, I grew up in one of those Southern Baptist churches where it was black cover only, King James only, and they taught us all about God's anger. They stressed it. God is angry at you. Okay? I'm sorry. I really am. I, I don't want God to be angry at me. And, and we stress this in the church and we paint God as an angry God, and then we wonder why nobody wants to get to know God. You ever been around somebody when they lose their temper? What's your general rule when somebody begins to lose their temper? You want to distance yourself from them. You want to put some space between you and them, especially if they, if they have like the, the, the temper storms, especially if and you start thinking about God and you read through the Old Testament and you see the judgment that he can bring down on us. And, and, and so we preach this in the church and we talk about God being an angry God. And then we look at people, but come to church and get to know God. Why would I do that? Why would I want to get to know somebody that's just angry all the time? Now, as it goes, um, I'm sure as God looks out at it, humanity, and I am sure he is very frustrated. Why is he frustrated? Because how frustrating would it be to love so much and be shunned so completely? How frustrating would it be to look at an individual and say, I love you so much that I'm willing to give my life for you, but yet they don't reciprocate. I'm sure we've all had those relationships where we feel like we're putting way more in the relationship than the other person. And those unbalanced relationships, they're frustrating. But I don't want you to get into this verse and just focus on God's anger because there is such a much bigger lesson in Psalm chapter 90 because after the psalmist mentions anger, he begins to talk about our mortality. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. So I am 52 years old. So 70 seems a whole lot closer than it did 30 years ago because 70 is only 18 years away. So that's the age of my oldest son. So by the time my son doubles up his age, I will be 70. That's kind of scary because... I understand my body doesn't work the way it used to. It doesn't heal as fast. I don't heal when I break things. I don't heal as fast anymore. And, and th Nancy's like, amen. <laughs> Nancy's like, she's got her pillow with her. She's like, amen to that. You just don't heal the way you used to. And because you know what? We are mortal beings. We are. Every single one of us someday, unless Jesus comes back beforehand, will have to deal with this idea of mortality. Because that's what happens. And you know what else happens? Life troubles. Think about it. Even the best of our years, um, we have problems. Psalm put it this way, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If you really think about our year, we talk about 2020 being an unprecedented year and how much turmoil there seems to be going on, whether it be from a social area or from a, from a COVID area or a politic area. And we think about how terrible 2020 was. I could go back to 2019 and give you lots of terrible things too. 2018? 17. I could go back to 2006 and tell you just some horrendous stories in our life. I mean, every single year, if I wanted to, I could tell you they're nothing but trouble. And you know what? 2021, 
it's going to have troubles. All of them are this way. And it's easy for us to get into this idea that, well, everything is trouble, everything is difficult, but I want you to see what is going on here. The fact that we are mortal, the fact that all of our days are troubled, we all have problems every single day, the point the psalmist gets to is that last little sentence. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now, number your days is not telling you to go to Hallmark and buy a wall calendar. Okay? We number our days very well. I can tell you just about how many days it would be before my youngest son heads off to college. We're down to about 1,000. Okay? In about a thousand days, he's going to be headed to college, and my oldest son's going to be out of college, and it's just going to be me and my wife, and who knows what we're going to do. Alaska, here we come, right? I mean, so, so we number our days. We have calendars and all of those things, but that's not what God is talking about here. He's not talking about, he's saying, number your days. Realize you have a finite number of days in your life. You don't know how many they are. I don't know how many days you get, but you have a finite number of days. Therefore, every single day has the same value to it. Because you don't know if you're going to get another one off the deck tomorrow. Now, if you take that philosophy, it changes everything about the way that I live my particular life. Because you understand that means the past is behind me. I love the way King Solomon put it. He writes this in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 10. The end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why, the, why, why, the, do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such things. Very wise words from a wise man, but let me go ahead and put them in modern day language so that you don't miss the points. See, here's the point. How you finish is more important than how you start. I don't care how you got here. Okay? I don't know what your past is. I don't know what all of the events that happened in your life. I don't know your spiritual upbringing. And maybe it's great, and maybe it's a good testimony, but you do realize how you got to this moment is not as important as what you do with this moment. You could have gotten here by living a totally outlandish pagan life, and you, this is the first time you've ever darkened a church doorstep, or you've signed on to a church online stream. It does not matter. Maybe you grew up in the church, and you know what? You can go back years and years and years and years and look at Sunday school roles, and you can prove to me that you've been in church since you were in the cradle role. You know what? Today, that doesn't matter. What matters is this moment. What do you do from now to the finish? A patient soul is more productive than a, pride, than a prideful attitude. So you're telling me I can be better off if I be still and take a look at the moments than if I just think I know all the answers and run straight, in, straight forward into something? Yeah. That's what Solomon's trying to teach his son here. But remember, Solomon is writing this book as an old man. This is kind of like his farewell speech. And he's laying it all out there to say, look, I've tried all the American dream that you want to try. I've tried everything, and let me tell you what I've learned. Running full speed ahead isn't always the way that you want to do things. And then he puts out the, the whammy. Living in the past is a foolish endeavor. Now, I'm not saying you can't talk about days of old. I'm not saying we can't learn from the past. I'm not saying any of those things. I'm just saying that you can't live there. And this is hard, folks. You know what? Even the best of us struggles with living in the past. Remember Job, the guy that was the upright guy? I told you we'll be looping through his story a few times this year. This is what he said when he's confronted with his days. How I long for the months gone by. For the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone on my head and by his light I walked through the darkness. Oh, woe is me, Job. Oh, for the days when I was in my prime, when God's intimate friendship blessed my house, 
when the Almighty was still with me and my children were around me, when my path was drenched with cream and the rock poured out for, the, poured out for me streams of olive oil. Job is going through a really hard time in his life and he's looking out. He's like, where are the good old days? Where's the sunshine and the rainbows? Where's all the things that, that I wanted? That life was so good. How did it get so bad? And we hear this today. How many times in the past, we'll give it six months, have you used the phrase, I can't wait till things get back to normal? Let me ask you a question. What if this is normal? Huh? What if this is the normal? What if this is where God has put us because God has something in this moment and this time that he wants us to do and we're so busy looking for getting back to normal, we're missing the opportunity God put right here before us. See, the problem is, is we're comparing normal to how things used to be and we're comparing normal to how I want things to be in the future. We're so busy running from our past and so busy chasing our future, we've forgotten today. This is God's day. And so what's so bad about living in the past? Well, I, I just want to give you a practical thing right from that clip I showed you right at the beginning. I picked that clip very carefully because I want you to see what happens. They tell Barry to run and man, he puts on his shoes and he gets in that block and they say go and you saw the little lightning bolt in his eyes and he took off and he's topping 300 miles an hour, which by the way is nowhere near this guy's top speed. Okay, he's got a whole lot more in the tank than that. You'll see it in a few weeks. So he's going at about 300 miles an hoor He even lets out a little yoo-hoo leap as he's going. He can't believe he's moving. They think it's impossible. They got the radar gun and it just keeps going up. It can't keep up with him. And then it happens. You saw that little flashing start. He goes back to the day that his mother, he watched his mother get murdered. He goes back to that moment when, when everything was chaotic and that becomes his focus. And what happens? crash. He got so focused on the past, he got so focused on what ha happened in his life, the troubles and woes that he had in his life, that he stopped, he stopped paying attention to the road and he crashed right into the barrier in front of him. Tell me we haven't all done this in our life. We're going along at God's speed and God's doing things in our life and God is working in our life. And you know what? We, something from our past pops up and wraps around us. And before we know it, crash. Because we got way too focused on our past that we just couldn't deal with it. See, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19 puts it this way. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and the streams in the wasteland. In other words, don't get so possessed with making it the way it used to be, because guess what? This may be the way it's supposed to be. This may be the normal that God desires for us. God says, I am an ever-changing God. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. But as far as my methods, they are constantly changing. Go ask the Jews. Everything was always changing. It's echoed in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, it being his faith. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. In Christ Jesus. Now, living in the past is bad, but I just want you to also take a moment to see there's a problem if you want to live in the future. Because your future is unpromised. James chapter 4 verse 14 says, Why do you even not know what will happen? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So the psalmist said 70 years, so, so you think about it. This country has been in existence for 2,000 years, a little bit over 2,000 years now. 200 years, sorry. We've been, Jesus has been 2,000 years since Jesus has been here. Before Jesus, there was tens of thousands of years of recorded civilization. So, so all of these years are together, and I'm here for 70 of them. That's not a whole lot of years, is it? 
Even in the realm of our country, I'm only going to make it about maybe a third of what they're going to do, and that's if I live to 70. That's about a third of our nation's age, right? The thing is, is as I get older, the nation's going to get older. At least that's the way I think it's going to work. Who knows? God might have a different plan. I don't know. But you get the point. My life is very small when I throw it into the pond of time. And so for me to worry about what I did in the past catching up with me or me worrying about my, what I'm going to do, always worrying about what I'm going to do in the future, you understand what happened is I've given away the one thing God gave me. You know what the thing I gave away was? Today. What do I do today? Proverbs puts it this way, do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what it may bring. I got a plan for tomorrow. I got things I need to accomplish. My guess is I'll be lucky if I accomplish 25% of them because other things are going to come in the way. Things are just going to happen that I did not plan. And so I do want you to see that that causes us sometimes to have a little bit of lost focus. We can't just live in a whatever mentality. This is what Peter tells us. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of, day of God and speed its coming. So Peter tells me that really my focus needs to not just be on what am I going to do in the future? What is my retirement plan? What's my bank account look like? These are all things that, that as you get 52, you, you become much more aware of what the retirement budget looks like. I didn't worry much about retirement budgets when I was 20-some years old. And if you'd ask me when my teens, I'm like, retire? I'm still working on getting a job. What are you talking about, retire? These days, it's, it's a conversation we have. But here's the thing. God wants to know, what are you doing to speed is coming? And you do understand that isn't talking about going out and doing pickets. You realize what speeds the coming of God, right? It's the number one indicator in the Bible. When everybody has had the opportunity to hear the name of Christ. Isn't that interesting? He says, everybody, every need, everybody's going to get a chance. Everybody's going to get to hear. So if I really want to speed the coming of Christ, you know what the fastest way to do it is? Spread the gospel. Go out and witness to people. Find people that's never heard it before and make sure they hear it. That's what we are told to do. Make the most of our moments. And while we are making the most of our moments, he tells us, don't worry. This is what he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't go borrow tomorrow's troubles. After all, you probably have enough today. You probably have enough left over from yesterday to fill today. Why do you want to go get tomorrow's and bring it in there? And then you got to worry about tomorrow's, yesterday's, and today's all at the same time. But isn't this what we do? We're so, again, busy chasing our future and running from our past that we forget about what are you going to do today? What has God given you to do today? So I'm going to do a little numbers game for you, and, and I'm cautious as how I do this because people are very skeptical when you start throwing out numbers. Just so you know, these numbers were as of Monday this week is when I looked them up, okay? Because I, I just want to let you know, I looked them up, and so not debating the numbers. I just want you to see some numbers to put some things in perspective for us in our today. So this week we passed the half a million mark in, in, in the U.S. where they are basically saying there are half a million people that have died due to COVID, relation, COVID complications. Half a million is a big number for me to, to comprehend. So I thought I would whittle it down and let's just talk about what they're reporting in Virginia. So as of Monday, and again, I'm not disputing the numbers. I'm not having a debate about the numbers. I'm just giving you the numbers. They attribute 7,037 people that passed away in Virginia due to COVID complications. It may not have been COVID itself, but COVID complications, okay? Of that 7,037, 329 of them are in our area. So that's what they call the Shenandoah Valley area that includes Stanton and Augusta County and Rockingham and Waynesboro and all, all of that. So there have been 329 people that they have reported that have lost their life due to COVID complications. Okay? That's a number I can work with now because these are people that are within driving distance 
of us. They're in our own backyard. So I went out, and according to the most recent survey, and again, this number might be a little high too, 65% of Americans claim to be Christians. Now, this is what they claim. I'm, I'm not diving into people's hearts. I'm not, I didn't go out and do a poll or a survey to see how accurate this was. By the latest Pew Research poll, 65% of Americans claim to be Christians. So I want you to follow the numbers for a second. Because even if these numbers are even close to right, 2020 and the pandemic that we're currently living in means that the lost loss look like this. 2,462 people went on to be with the Lord with no relationship with Christ. Wrap your brain around that one. That means 115 people that are within driving distance of us went on to be with the Lord and never accepted Christ by their own admission. Now let me put that in perspective. There's a sign when you come in up the steps in, in here, and there's a little sign there that says, this sanctuary has a maximum seating capacity of 99 people. So that means the people that would they have lost their life during this pandemic that they have attributed to COVID that the statistics say would not have been a Christian. We couldn't even fit them in our maximum capacity in this building. Wrap your brain around those numbers for a second. Does that make this more real? I'm, I'm not trying to preach, yeah, we got to wear, I'm not trying to preach social here, the socially as far as what we need to do to stop the virus. I'm not worried about the virus. What am I worried about? Well, this is the church. I'm concerned about the people that are passing on from this world that never had the chance to establish their relationship with Christ or maybe needed one more chance, but because I'm not doing the things, I'm not taking advantage of my today because I'm so busy worried about my past and so busy chasing my future, I'm not worried about my today. And meanwhile, on our watch in our area, the numbers say at least, probably more, because that number is probably low as far as the percentage, I mean, it's high for the percentage, 115 people. I pondered those numbers for a while, and I began to ask myself, what on earth am I doing? We've become so obsessed with keeping ourselves safe that I wonder if we've forgotten. This was never designed to be safe. Could you imagine the early church going into the mode of saying, well, you know, they're persecuting and Christ killing Christians, so this is becoming a deadly thing. This ain't safe to go out there. How about we just, like, keep this kind of to ourselves? Let's just keep this safe until things get better. Here's the question. What if things don't ever get better? What if this is the norm? Are we, the church, prepared to do the job that God has given us to do, even if this is the norm? Are we, the church, willing to go out and reach? See, I want to give you a today mentality. Told you being still isn't all about doing nothing. I want you to think hard. I love what Joshua says. It's, I know this is one of Sherry's favorite verses. I love this verse. Um, it gets quoted here a lot. Joshua chapter 24, verse 10, 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living, but as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Now, I'm quoting Joshua. I'm not making some emphatic statement from Barry because I struggle with the today mentality. I do. And I admire the fact that Joshua is brave enough to say, you guys do what you want to do. You do what you think you have to do. You do what you think you need to do. But as far as this family, we're here. And we're here to do service for God. See, for us to do service to God, we have to be willing to give God the glory for the day and realize this is his day. Psalm 118, 24 says, The Lord has done, done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for all for the glory of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all for the name of the Lord, 
for the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It's interesting, when we built this new purpose statement that we put in place at Parkview Christian Church, you notice what the first sentence is? To give glory to God. What is the most glorious thing you can give back to God? It's not a song. Good thing, because I can't sing. God, I'm sure, appreciates the songs. What's the most glorious thing that you can give back to God? Another life that's willing to follow him. That's why giving glory to God by meeting people where they are, by sharing Jesus in a meaningful way, by encouraging them to grow in a relationship with him, that's the, how you give glory to God. So today, are we willing to do this? Are we willing to take that kind of approach to our ministry? Are we willing to make the, the, most, the most of every opportunity that we get? This is what it says. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Paul tells us that, you know what? The days aren't going to get any better. If you're waiting for some white horse to come in and magically pass some kind of laws that's going to make the world all better, guess what? I hate to tell you this. It's not coming. This is the environment that God has put us into to make the most of this opportunity to reach as many people as we can, as best we can, making the use of every means that we have at our disposal. Wow. Really? Yeah. I'm not worried about the past. How I got here is not important. The future? I always have an eye on the future. You can't just ignore the future. I make plans, but here's the deal. Plans change. They do. They're fluid. I can't get so obsessed about my future that I forget that I have a today mission. Now, maybe you're here today, and you know what? You've never accepted Christ. And this is one of those sermons I want to take a moment and just talk to you personally. So if you're here today and, and you've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, don't put me on autopilot. You can listen because you might draw something out of here. But if you're in the sound of my voice, whether you're in the building, you're online, or you're going to watch this later, I want to share a couple of things with you really, really, really quick. Thing number one, make today your day. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of your salvation. Folks, I cannot promise you what you'll get tomorrow. I cannot promise you that you will have another opportunity to ever invite Jesus Christ into your life. But I can promise you this, you have today. You have this moment, you have this time, you have this second, and I'm encouraging you today, do it. Do it. It's echoed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith like a helmet, I mean like a breastplate, and hope of salvation, and, and hope of salvation as a helmet. You get the idea that today, I only have today to make my decision. Because the moment we walk out of this moment, there's going to be another one waiting for you. I told you how fast that, that Flash was the fastest man alive. Would you like to hear something crazy? As fast as this man was, he could never outrun his past. And you know what the other crazy thing is? As fast as this man was, he could never catch his future. He could only run in the moment he was given. He could only decide, what am I going to do at this moment? And the moment he tried anything else, he tried to fix it, to try to predestine his future. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks. Or he tried to focus on his past. He got that great big crash because you know what? Today is your day. So if you're here today and you've never accepted Christ, let me just make this really simple for you. Here it is. He came. He gave his life on a cross for you. He rose from the dead. And he desires to have a relationship with you. That's it. It's that simple. I'm not here to scare you. I'm not here to quote some kind of statistics. I'm not here. You know what? This is really simple. Do you want to have a relationship with a God that loves you so much that he gave his life for you? Today, if you're in the sound of my voice, if you're here today and you're leaving, stop and talk to Bud. 
We have a little room set up right now at least that we can, we can sit down and we can talk about what it means to be a Christian. Don't leave here today if you have that kind of concern on your life. If you're in the sound of my voice, you're online, or you're, you're like I said, you're going to listen to this later, and you have this kind of question about what does it mean to be, how do I make the most of today? Email, this chat, there's, there's phone calls, you can do whatever it takes. I'm sure if you try to reach out to this church, we will get to you quickly. Because you know what? Today's the day. Today's the day that we make the choice as a church. You know what? Circumstances, yes, we want to be safe and we want to be compliant. But you understand, our goal was much bigger than this pandemic. We have another pandemic we're worried about. It's called sin. And it's called eternity. Much bigger than... And we have to get back to the business of doing what God called us to do. Seeking and saving the lost. And today, if you're in in the sound of my voice and you are lost, I have good news for you. I've met the compass. His name is Jesus. I encourage you to reach out and we'll show you what it means to have a relationship with him.